Shalom. All right. Uh, so last week, we uh, covered the beginning of Daniel chapter 5 uh, and dealt with kind of the centerpiece problem that everybody deals with, pride, right? And uh, we juxtaposed the world of ancient Babylon with modern Babylon uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, modern America. And we found a lot of areas of similarities, and we discovered at the end of the message last week a hope in the heart of the chapter, which was that Daniel does survive and live on. Tonight, we're going to see and hear the remaining part of chapter 5 and dance around into chapter 6 a good bit. And just so you know, I don't think that I'm going to get through this message. We'll see, but I don't think I'm going to make it. But don't worry, we'll just pick up wherever we don't get to next time we're together by the grace of God. So let me read some scripture to you, and as I read it, I'm going to stop and comment a little bit, and then we'll get into the the heart of the message. Uh, Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, saying, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to somebody else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and tell him its meaning. Your majesty, God most high, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom as well as greatness, glory, and splendor. Because of the grandeur that he bestowed on him, all the, peoples, all, na- uh, all the peoples, nations, and languages dreaded and feared him. He killed whomever he wanted and spared anyone he wanted. He raised up whomever he wished and humbled anyone he wished. Now, this is so difficult for us, but since it is an election year in the United States, and as the governments around the world are going through huge power struggles... I thought it important to make a comment here. It seems like the UN and other governments are continually creating havoc and problems, and they're constantly stirring up trouble against Israel on a regular basis. And one of the things that I want to make a comment is this, that Nebuchadnezzar was not a good man. He's not a good king. He was a dictator. He enslaved people. He destroyed Jerusalem. But he was being used by God for a purpose. And in a moment, we're going to see in chapter 6, the, which is the parallel story to chapter 3 of the fiery furnace. This is chapter 6. We'll get into it in a minute, which is the lion's den. They're parallel stories about faith. Daniel will have potential to potentially suffer physically, but most certainly he's suffering emotionally because he has the threat of death upon him and he has a decision to make. God uses and used Babylon to discipline Judah and he raised up a king and he gave him his greatness. The Bible says that. We just read. He made him great. He raised him above all other nations even though he knew this king would kill people. This king would hurt people. Now, I know that does not make sense to us. I know that's a difficult spot for any of us to accept. It's a challenge beyond challenge, actually. But there's a big principle of the kingdom, and that is this. Godly character is produced in the pressure of suffering. Whether nationally or personally, we grow more in the ditch than on the mountaintop. What is the enemy of that? Complacency. Complacency is built when comfort is continuous. When we live in a comfort all the time, we become complacent. And when we become complacent, we lose the edge. We lose the ability to be on top of the game with the Lord. We lose the drive to grow. It's in the fire of suffering. The pressure of pain. Where the intimacy with God and the character of the soul is firmly developed. (coughs) We must remember being stretched is a good thing. But when we're stretched, it means we're suffering a bit. 
The level is dependent on the place that God's taking you or I or the discipline we need. During this election year, we might want to remember that we can participate, best participate in prayer, but God is the determining factor for the United States of America. So trust God. All right, next verse. But when his heart became haughty and his spirit hardened with pride, this is verse 20, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. Speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, he was driven away from among men. His mind became like an animal. His dwelling was with a wild, bad word. He fed on grass like an ox and his body was damp with the dew of heaven until he recognized that God most high is sovereign over the realm of mankind and that he sets up over it whomever he wills. Did you guys hear that? He sets up over the realms of mankind whoever he wills. I'm just telling you, you need to trust that right now. You need to trust God's in charge. Verse 22, But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. Instead, you've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. You had the vessels of his house brought before you, and you and your nobles, your consorts, your concubines, have been drinking wine in them. You have praised the gods of made of silver and gold, of bronze, of iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. Yet, You did not honor the God who holds in his hand your very breath and all your ways. Therefore, the hand was sent from him that wrote this inscription. Notice the in Hebrew, it's a it's an idiom. It comes out in English. In this case, it usually doesn't come out in English as well, but in this case it does. He says, You have negated the hand that holds your breath, and therefore the hand came to produce your destruction. It's a powerful thought. How did Belshazzar come against the Lord? How did he uh, go against the Lord? He took the sacred vessels that were dedicated to the Lord and for the Lord's use, and he used them for commonality. And then he praised handmade God. If you get nothing else I say tonight, I would recommend that you do a life check for yourself. Are there any areas that have been dedicated to God in your life as sacred, which you are now using as common? And are you bowing down, consciously or even subconsciously, to any man-made God? Are you creating your own God in your image, to be conformed to your thoughts, your behaviors, or your words. Just do a checkup and make sure you're clean before the Lord. Moving on, verse 25, it says, Now this is the writing that was inscribed, Mine, Mine, Tikel, Uparsin. This is the interpretation of the inscription. Mine, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. By the way, you don't ever really want to hear that. Just so you know. <laughs> Tikel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Hmm. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, they clothed Daniel with purple, put a chain of gold around his neck, issued a proclamation about him that he would be the authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Now you got to think to yourself, what? He must have been so drunk. (laughs) All right. I mean, he was using them gold vessels like nobody's business, just chugging them back. No. One of two things was happening. One, he was going to do what kings do. He gave his word. He was going to follow through on what he said. Regardless of the good news or bad news, if someone could read it, someone could tell what it is, this is what he promised. So he did his word. And two, possibly subconsciously, possibly consciously, in speculation, he was kissing up, hoping it would change. 
hey, that's, that's, you did amazing. I'm going to make you third ruler in the kingdom right now. I mean, you're sticking with that story, are you? We don't know why he did it, but he did follow through. And then it says on that very night, King Belshazzar of the Chaldeans was slain. God does judge kingdoms. And God has the power to take them down or lift them up instantaneously. And here we see the end of Babylon. Going over to chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, So Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps, in English that's presidents, to rule throughout the whole kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So there's your hope. In the midst of a tragedy, in the midst of pride, in the midst of a destruction of a nation, the end of the story, done, Daniel is raised up. Daniel stands firm, because God wanted him to. Now, for those of you that love the academic world a little bit, I'm going to give you a little thing tonight uh, for a few moments, then we'll get back into the heart of what I really want to share, but I thought it would be important, particularly for you Googlers out there, uh, who are going to want to understand this argument, uh, a little thought. There has been some controversy over the years regarding the name Darius the Mede. Ancient Babylon and Greek sources identified the king who conquered Babylon as Cyrus, who we will read does become the king of Babylon. But Darius has not been identified and was not mentioned in ancient sources outside of the Bible, with the exception of Josephus, who was many centuries later and would have had access to the scriptures of Daniel. And so certainly he didn't mind putting it in there. Thus, many have argued that Daniel made a blunder. And when he said that Darius the Mede received the kingdom instead of Cyrus. Now, there have been a lot of scholarly debates. There's been a lot of arguments put forth over the centuries. And uh, as the decades wane on, we find more and more archaeological and historical documents and more evidence that helps us to clarify these scriptures. I won't bore you with all the details of the arguments tonight, um, but there is at least two solutions to it, and one of which is probably the most likely. Uh, one of the great scholars, Wiseman, proposed that the name Darius the Mede is an alternate name for Cyrus the Persian. Persia had already conquered Mede, Median, and it was already their kingdom prior to this moment when Babylon fell. Two names for people was very common in ancient times, particularly for royalty. And we've already seen that even in Daniel's life. Daniel and his companions all had two names. In fact, two languages were used in this book. And the, the expression, the Medes and the Persians, refers to a single kingdom with two separate parts because they're all under one kingdom. Cyrus the Great actually conquered Mede he was a Persian, in 550 B.C. So when Babylon was conquered in 539 B.C.E., his kingdom was already including Media. So it's very possible that Darius is Cyrus with a different name. Prophets before Daniel also predicted the overthrow of the Babylonians by the Medes and Persians. Isaiah 13, verse 17, Isaiah 21, verse 2. Jeremiah 51, verse 11 and 28, and uh, Isaiah 21, verse 2, uh, talks about the Persians. Scholars have proposed that Darius, and, uh, that Darius could actually be a name for a throne name, if you will, like a pharaoh or a king or Rome used what name? Caesar. There were a bunch of Caesars. And in fact, there's five different Dariuses that are listed as kings of Babylon and Persia post the Babylonian fall that we're talking about. They're all after date-wise, but they're listed in the annual, annals. So it's very possible that Darius became a surname for the one who is the king uh, because of the post-history. What I would say is that archaeology continues to bring out the truth in the scriptures 
And there's not a lot of debate today that indicates that this is wrong because there's a lot of plausible answers to this uh, in about eight or ten of the articles that I read on it. All right, back to our story. Daniel's going to speak the truth to Belshazzar. The answer is going to happen that night. Daniel does not end. He becomes promoted to one of the three administrators to rule the entire kingdom. He doesn't go down with the ship. He's elevated. And that power of God is amazing. God raises this humble servant, and he removes the prideful one. This is God's standard throughout all of history. So as we begin to look in chapter 6, and the, which is a parallel, as I mentioned earlier, to chapter 3, I want to kind of highlight a, something here. Chapter 6, as you know, is pretty much the, the biggest story in the book of Daniel. It's the one that everybody knows, the lion's den. It's become the theme of the book, if you will. So let's read just a little bit here. Starting in verse 2, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the whole kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. These satraps were accountable to them so that the king would not be troubled. Now this Daniel was distinguishing himself among the supervisors and satraps because he had an extraordinary spirit in him. In fact, the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. At this time, the supervisors and satraps tried to find ground for a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, but they were unable to find faults or corruption because he was trustworthy and no negligence or dishonesty could be found in him. Finally, these men said, we're not going to find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless we find something against him regarding the law of his God. So tonight I want to share with you, the rest of the evening, a message that I entitled, An Extraordinary Life. Father, I pray for the next few moments that you give me the words to say. Should I say anything that is not from you, let it quickly be forgotten. But should I speak your words tonight, let it go into the souls, into the hearts, and let it bear good fruit. In Yeshua's name, amen. Daniel, it says, had an extraordinary spirit. The Aramaic word here can mean excellent or praiseworthy. It even carries a value of above others. <clears throat> he was a step above everyone else. Now, we know that he was royal. We know that he was intelligent. We know that he was gifted. But there's lots of talented, gifted people. There's lots of people that are steps above but this seems to be something different. An extraordinary spirit. Something that everybody recognized, both pagan and faithful. The enemies and the fans could see it. Most importantly, God himself had it. He saw it. It is an extraordinary story. So we ask ourselves, is it the intelligence? Was he a good studier? Is it the gifts that he stewarded? Did he manage those so well? Did he have the seven habits of highly successful people? Did he understand the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership? Is that what this man was? Was he so good at all the details that man, the whole world just knew? Did he speak with the eloquence of a great orator. Did he have a golden voice? Did he look good? Was he a stud? What was his secret? What made the whole world, including the enemy that had just taken down Babylon, look at him and say, there's an extraordinary spirit on that man. There's something so beyond. I can't just leave him in that lowly role of being over 120 satraps. i got to make him over the whole kingdom. Now, how many of us would love to have the whole world that we know, those who hate us and those who love us, 
all be able to say, regardless of their feeling about us, there's an extraordinary spirit on him. Wouldn't you love to have that? I mean, that's the testimony of the Lord. That's the testimony of God being in you. What is the secret to Daniel's character? What made him so far above the other presidents? Oswald Chambers makes a great comment. The show business, quotes, which is so incorporated into our view of Christian work today, has caused us to drift far from our Lord's conception of discipleship. It is instilled in us to think that we have to do exceptional things for God. We have not. We have to be exceptional in ordinary things. To be holy in mean streets, among mean people, surrounded by sordid sinners. That is not learned in five minutes. Our microwave faith won't get it. Our gleaning of great knowledge because we listen to so many things all the time. Give me more knowledge. Give me more knowledge. Give me more knowledge. Let me hear another sermon. Let me hear another teaching. Let me hear, see another video. Let me get another, another, another. I'm here to tell you we're overwhelmed with our knowledge and totally underwhelmed with our extraordinary spirit. As we continue to see week after week the sad stories of fallen ministers and hurting people because of their sin, we're watching the show business take a dive. I preached about three years ago a series called Ecclesia. And in the fourth sermon of that message series, I said there is a major shift coming to the church system in the world. And the system was broken, is broken, and God was going to change it and shift it, and it was going to be dramatic. And I believe we are seeing the breakings publicly. We're seeing the, the, the system begin to shift and crash because God is bringing a reckoning and an awakening to the system of modern, traditional, and evangelical church world. What is the difference then between so many people and Daniel? Why is his life so extraordinary? Well, I believe that verse 11 gives us a hint. Now, when Daniel learned that a written decree had been issued, the, they got him on his law. You can't pray. He went to his house where the windows in his upper room opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he knelt down, prayed, and gave thanks before his God. And read that bold print with me. Just as he did before. Yes, Daniel did have a highly successful habit. He had a routine. It included the most valuable of all other routines. Three times a day he faced Jerusalem and he prayed, giving thanks to God. He did two things that have become actually part of religion. And in many ways, they became religious. And they turned off many Jewish people from their own orthodoxy. In Christian circles, many rejected liturgy, written prayers, any kind of structure because they became so rote. But Daniel did two things. He faced Jerusalem and he prayed three times a day. Both of which ended up being traditions in the different faiths. The oldest fixed prayer in Judaism is called the Shema. Everybody say Shema. I know many of you are familiar with that. It comes from De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And we always chant the first part of it. We do a little chant. But we don't ever read the whole thing. It's actually three paragraphs out of the Bible. The Shema is Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41. And they give a guidance. They give away, 
This is the heart of who we are to be with our God and who God is with us. It's called the Shema because it begins Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it goes on. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your body. And it, it keeps building and building through those paragraphs. And it helps us to see a way to live in God, a way to teach, a way to honor God. So that's the oldest fixed prayer because in that prayer it actually says, when you arise and when you go to sleep, do this. So this, this became the prayer. Twice a day, the Jewish people around the world will say the Shema. Some of you may participate in that. You may get up in the morning and say the Shema. Some of you may go to bed at night and say the Shema before you go to bed. It's a great practice. It's a tradition, but it's part of what was commanded here to do this when you arise and when you go to sleep. Then there was another development in prayer and liturgy and just repeating things, and that occurred at the time of Daniel. This Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE. People were not able to sacrifice anymore at the temple because there was no temple and they've been taken out of Jerusalem and they're living in Babylon. So what did they do? They chose to pray as a substitute for the sacrifice. Now they had some prayers. They said, we can't go and sacrifice. We can't commit to that. So now we'll just make sure we commit to prayer every day at specific times. Now the Bible tells us that there were two daily sacrifices required. There was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice, a lamb in each that was done at the temple. Then there were other sacrifices that were voluntary, and many of them happened during the day and, and uh, happened at noontime. And then other times there were, you know, during the feast there were sacrifices. But what they did in exile was they organized and said, we're going to stay faithful to God and we're going to pray. We're going to make sure we don't miss the morning and the evening and then they even added a noontime prayer uh, to that. And after the exile, those daily prayer services continued, and they began to write a written prayer that became known as the Shimon Esre, the standing prayer, the prayer. It's got 18 benedictions to it, and we call it the Amidah. The stand, Amidah means to stand, so it's the standing prayer. It's said three times a day to this day in every synagogue in, in the world. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you'll get up in the morning, you'll go to prayers. If you can make it at lunch, you'll go back and say prayers. And at dinner time, you'll go and do prayers at the synagogue before you show up at home to do whatever you're going to do. Three times a day, ever since Daniel's day, that's been happening in exile as well as when they got into the land. We read in the Psalms, chapter 55, verse 17 and 18, as for me, I will call on God, for Adonai will save me. Read this with me. Evening, morning, and noon. I what? <laughs> I complain and moan, and he hears my voice. Now, that sounds like us. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'm really going to pray three times a day, but I will whine three times a day, absolutely. Absolutely. Guaranteed, I'll show up three times a day to complain. But it does seem to be an indication that in the history and in the understanding, the roteness of how they did things, the structure, I show up in the evening, I show up in the morning, and I show up at noon. Now, just for those of you that like learning a little bit of academics, there's a reason it's structured that way in the sentence. Evening, morning, and noon. The day begins when? In the evening. So the first prayer is at the beginning of the day, which is in the evening. That's when you say your first prayer. Your second prayer time is in the morning. And the third prayer time would be at noon. So evening, morning, and noon, I complain and I moan. He hears my voice. The three prayer times. Early Christianity decided to recite the Lord's Prayer three times a day. 9, 12, and 3 p.m., replacing the Amidah because they weren't interested in the Hebrew traditions. Uh, the Dadachi, uh, which was an do ancient document from the first century, we found it with the Dead Sea Scrolls, it gives in instructions on the practices of faith. 
Now, it was said to be written by uh, anonymously by someone who called it the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the Goyim, or the nations. Okay? And it was an attempt of the early followers on how to govern and organize this newly founded ecclesia, uh, particularly directing it towards the non-Jews who had come to faith. Now, this was never canonized as scripture. In fact, there's lots of scholarly debate on how authentic it is and not authentic. There's lots of arguments about it. So I'm not telling you to own this. I'm only bringing it up to say in the first century, there was a document that floated around that's been out there and it's still there today that gives us at least a picture of what was being talked about. Does that make sense? This isn't what you're supposed to do, but it's a picture. So let me read from chapter 8 of the Dadachi for you. Fasting and prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But let not your fast be with the hypocrites, for they fast on the second and fifth day of the week. Rather, fast on the fourth day and the preparation day. So there were some traditions that were fasting and praying on the second and fifth day of the week. Some of those were uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jews. So this was a little anti-Semitic right out of the gate. Interestingly, they told him to practice on the uh, fast on the fourth day and the preparation day, which means in the first century they understood Sabbath was on the seventh day because preparation day was the day before the Sabbath. You prepared for the Sabbath. So in case you're wondering if Sunday is the Sabbath, the answer is Sunday is not the Sabbath. That's the first day of the week. The seventh day of the week is the Sabbath. There's a book about that. If you're curious, shameless plug, the art of rest, how Shabbat can change your world. Okay? Fellow, I wrote it. I, I like him. Do not pray like the hypocrites, but rather as the Lord commanded in his gospel, like this. And then there's the Lord's prayer that comes from Matthew. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily needful bread and forgive us our debt as we also forgive our debtors. Bring us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the power and the glory forever. And then it closes with pray this how many times a day? Three times a day. Are you seeing a pattern, everybody? There's a pattern here. Even today, there are many Lutheran and Anglican churches that ring their church bells across the world with their bell towers three times a day, in the morning, at noon, and the evening, telling the, the faithful to say the Lord's Prayer. In Catholicism, not to be outdone by the Jews, much less the first century, they have seven times of daily prayer. I'm not making this up. When the Protestants broke away from the Catholic Church, they did not leave all of its trappings. Different denominations have traditions that go back to ancient Catholicism and go back to the earliest roots of the Reformation. And those traditions include prayers, structured, and prayer times. They, they have what they call in traditional church, whether it be Greek Orthodoxy or traditional Anglican, Lutheran, um, Episcopal, many of those, uh, those uh, sects, they have what they call canonical hours, which are the set hours by the canon of their denomination on when you are supposed to pray. Over the centuries, there have been many prayer books, Many patterns have been developed, many liturgies, even biblical repeated prayers. In fact, we might be able to say that historically, our Bible is a book of prayer. It's commanded, and there's examples of it. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples gather together for the first activity they do after the resurrection. In verse 14, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible says this brand new group of followers of Yeshua would gather together and it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. In Acts chapter 6, they're given a task. They have to appoint some new deacons to take care of widows and orphans and wait on tables so that the apostles can develop and write uh, material and pray and work. And it says this, verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
Prayer was at the heart of every meeting they had. And although over time prayer became religious and full of a lot of extras, there can be no doubt that prayer was the central piece of faith from as far back as the Bible records. So Daniel here in chapter 6 shows us that his power with man is preceded by his presence with God. His power with humanity comes because he has presence with God. In the partial we read this last week, Behalotecha, Numbers chapter 8, there's a great teaching in there, instructions about the lighting of the menorah. And the instructions are given to the priest on how to light this, okay? There's a room in uh, Israel, uh, there was a room in the temple called the holy place. And inside the holy place were three pieces of furniture, and one of them was the menorah. This is in Jerusalem, by the way, and the ladies took this picture this week. That's a fresh one. It's a great shot, by the way. Really a good picture. The lampstand is my favorite symbol in the Bible. In fact, it's really the only symbol of the people of God. It's a phenomenal symbol. In fact, it's found all over the world. Wherever Israel has gone, that symbol's found. It's been carvings. It's been found in documents and stone in different places all over the world. Archaeologists have discovered it embedded in ancient mosaic tiled floors. It's been found in decorations of ancient pottery, jewelry, artifacts, engravings, in catacombs and tombstones in the Middle East, all throughout Europe. Wherever the Jewish people went, the menorah followed. And I want to make a point tonight about Numbers chapter 8 in relation to this topic and the lighting of the menorah as I see it in relation to Daniel's prayer life to Daniel's power that came from what he did as he prayed. And I want to say this about the Numbers chapter 8 passage. Let me give you a point and then I'll bring it home for you. Light in secret is power in public. Light in secret is power in public. And if you go back and read Numbers chapter 8, which was our partial last week, You're going to see all these instructions about what the priest was to do to light that menorah. And where did that take place? I said it just a minute ago. Somebody tell me. In the holy place. Who was allowed to go into the holy place? The priest. Only the priest. Israel did not go. The common man did not go. The newspapers did not go. The radio shows did not go. The television stations did not go. Only the priests, the bloggers, didn't get a shot. There's a whole lot of ink spilled in your Bible about lighting that menorah, about how it's to be done, how it's to be managed. And I want to tell you, nobody ever saw them do it. It was a private ceremony between them and God. Are you hearing me? One of the most important jobs to be done was a priestly work at the table of showbread, the prayers at the altar of incense right in front of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, and lighting and trimming this menorah with its oil and keeping the oil in it and making sure it's always lit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never could dim. And this incredibly important job would be seen by nobody. find that fascinating. In a room of nourishment and intercession, the priest became light on behalf of others. The Lord is calling all of us that are priests to be light in darkness, in humility and intercession, where nobody sees you. We tend to think of being light. When I say be light in darkness, we tend to think of that as an outward work of witnessing. 
of doing some kind of servant work of labor. We tend to think of the visible work as that. And that's what matters. That's true. God desires all of us to serve tangibly. God commands us to witness, to share our faith. He commands us to take care of the poor, to care for the widows and the orphans, to work with those who are less fortunate. But the greatest work we can do is in the closed, dark room that no one sees, but that light can burst forth from. That, my friend, is the invisible realm where the actual visible realm can be changed. Never underestimate the light that comes in the secret place. Leonard Ravenhill, one of my favorite authors, possibly because he kicks me in the tush pretty regularly, wrote a book called um, Why Revival Tarries. For you readers out there, that's one to get. Here's my disclaimer. No, I don't agree with Leonard Ravenhill on all doctrine. Okay? He and I are theologically different in many ways. But it's a great book. It's a punch in the gut. And it was written in 1955. And I'm going to read you an excerpt from it. And you're going to think, well, that probably should have been written today. So imagine where we are. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. A man may study because his brain is hungry for knowledge, even Bible knowledge. But he prays. Because his soul is hungry for God. The realm of change is the realm where nobody sees you. We do a lot of study here. We do a lot of biblical literacy here. We do a lot of doctrine, a lot of theology. We try to get into the scriptures and break them down hebraically. And we try to really dig into the roots of the words. We try to really expose what the scripture is teaching. We want people to be biblically literate. We want you to learn and to grow. And for those of you that have been around for a while, you know this to be true. In fact, I would put this group of people, the B1 crowd, against most Bible colleges. I'd put you in any debate with any Bible student today. Because you ask a lot of questions, which tells me you guys study all the time. And you ask good questions. Most I can't answer. Well, it's really good. I mean, you guys really get it. You want more. You want the meat of the word. You want to eat it. You want to chew it. You want to understand it. You want to grasp what has been shellacked over with three points in a poem for way too long. You don't want skinny jeans and fog machines. Particularly on this guy. That's why a little three-piece band up here tonight's just fine. Doesn't matter. Because we're here to worship the one true God. Amen. We're not here to do shows. We're here to dig the Word of God. Are you with me on that, everybody? Isn't that what we are? That's who we really are. But even in that passion, which I have a deep and abiding passion for the Word of God, I have a deep heart from it, for it. It is... For all intents and purposes, my love language. Scripture is it from, it's it's where I eat. It's where I live and breathe. But we can err to be so passionate for more understanding and knowledge of Scripture that we forget to know the writer. Yeshua said it this way. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
then your Father who sees what is done in will reward you. A few years ago, I was at the wall in Jerusalem and I had two competing thoughts while I was there. There was a, a group of Hasidic Orthodox Jews uh, that pray there daily. And they have large liturgical prayers that are chanted out loud. They gather around Torah scrolls multiple times during the day and in groups and they read them and they pray out loud. And sometimes they're sitting and reading, sometimes they're standing and reading, and sometimes they're just screaming. And I was there at the wall and we were praying and I was trying to pray. And there was a particular man who was behind me and standing and began to yell his prayer so loud that most in the courtyard actually looked. He did not stop. And there was a part of me that loved the idea of these dedicated people who were desiring to follow the traditions of their forefathers and pass it on to their kids. Study of the Torah, the study of the traditions, the practice of memorizing and speaking the words. Well, on that hand, it was very inspiring because it had been passed on from generation to generation to generation and it was deep in their soul. As we say in Yiddish, they're kishkas. But there was another part that reminded me of Moses' instruction and Yeshua's command. Are they crying out to be seen and heard? Or are they crying out to actually talk to God? I don't know their heart. And I certainly don't want to be their judge. But I would say to each of us, could we be like Yeshua? And remember the power of our prayer is not its length or volume or wording. Years ago, Sherry and I were in Phoenix, Arizona in our little one-bedroom apartment. I think I, I, I looked it up. I asked her the name, but I couldn't remember. So there's our apartment complex in Phoenix. It's still there. So we were in our little one-bedroom apartment, our little postage stamp, and we were in a, a, a ministry program of which we were, you know, the oldest and most mature because we were uh, graduated college, and uh, we were now in another ministry training in school, and uh, I was... We're 23 years old. We're in our first year of marriage. Most of the people in the program were younger. Many of them had graduated high school a year or two years before. They were 18, 19, maybe 20, but hey, we were the ones, right? So we, uh, we brought some of them over to our apartment. We're going to have a little prayer meeting, a little gathering. We got some of them there. And there was one guy that was older than us. He was 25, and he had been to prison. And uh, he had spent five years in prison, and he'd gotten out. He was in ministry training with us. Great guy. Love this guy. And he asked if he could bring with him another guy who had gotten out of prison that he had been in prison with. Sure, man. Bring the prisoners. Come on, right? When you've done it to the prisoners, you've done it to the least of these. Bring them on in. Come on. So he brings uh, the, the, the prisoner's name, the former prisoner's name was Eddie. Now, Eddie was the size of Texas. And I don't mean fat. Eddie went to prison when he was 14 the first time. He was now nearing 35. He had done nothing but work out. His arms were the size of my legs. I was scared. Eddie didn't say anything. So we get in there and we're doing our charismatic two-step because we are passionate. You'll appreciate this. We acted Pentecostal, brother. That's what we did. We were, we were dancing a jig, man. We were doing it. So we started hooting and hollering, and I don't know any of your backgrounds necessarily, but if any of you are charismatic slash Pentecostal slash crazy, then possibly you've been in one of those meetings. Have you, anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you get in those meetings, and man, they get us screaming and hooting and hollering, and we get it going, right? But we're all praying. Now, we're young. We're in our 20s and 18 and 19. So it's one thing when a bunch of 40 and 50 and 60-year-olds are doing that, but boy, when you get the passion of a bunch of 20-year-olds, we're getting loud up in here. Yeah! So we are praying and praying and we are, we're saying every prayer you can imagine. Our words are long. Our sentences are big. And we're preach praying. Oh God, you know Mary's got that thing going on where she gossips all the time. Lord, please heal old Mary. You know, 
I mean, we got all the preach praying going on. We're praying our doctrines. We're praying our judgments on people that we disagree with. We're praying them all. Oh, you act like that's not how you pray? Y'all got real quiet right then, you bunch of liars. So we're praying all these prayers. And I'm telling you, that room is on fire. And everybody's doing the same thing. We're praying, and then we got the yes and amens going on. Amen. Yes, Lord. Oh, that's good. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Come on, God. I mean, we got it all. Eventually, our little group ran out of air. And we quit praying. It got real quiet. Now, Eddie is sitting there. And the whole time we've been praying, on and on and on and on, he didn't say one word. Not one word. Not a yes, not an amen, not an agreement. Total silence. Which, in my judgment phase, I attributed to, he don't know any better. I mean, you know, God loves to humble you. So it got quiet. And we sat there. And I kind of thought that was the end of it. And then Eddie goes, Dear God. I don't remember the words he spoke, but I have God bumps all over my skin right now. Because in that moment, the fresh air of the Spirit of God descended in that apartment like I had not experienced in years. And what I learned in that moment was I was praying to God. He was praying with God. We need to be a people who light our menorah in the secret place. Because Daniel lived an extraordinary life and had an extraordinary spirit on him. Because I'm convinced three times a day He met his creator. And that changed him every day. Let's be the best praying people we can be. Avina Malcheno, our father and king, we thank you because you challenge us to go to the secret place and to meet you. May each of us now grow in our time with you that we may have an extraordinary spirit like Daniel. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Well, I went a little bit long tonight, so we don't have time for Q&A tonight. Next week, I'm sure I'll go shorter. Don't forget July 12th is Community Shabbat. Sign up for Israel. Pray, 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 pray. God bless you, and shalom. See you next time.